I count it as a privilege to know Brother John Humphreys and respect and admire his years of service in the kingdom of the Lord. You can read about his biography in uh, the, the book, and it's on page 235 if you want to turn there or would, would like to follow up. But he's preached in multiple states, but also in numerous foreign countries, and in particular labored in India and has been preaching for over 65 years. And so there's a wealth of knowledge and experience that he brings to the podium this morning. He's written several of our commentaries on the Old Testament of the Truth Commentary series. He's contributed volumes or, or his, his work on Isaiah and Jeremiah as well. And he and his wife, they live in Kentucky near the land between the lakes, a beautiful region of the country. More recently, Brother John uh, has been of great help in the magazine. He provided a series of six articles over uh, several, uh, we, we presented them over the last year, uh, in which he addressed the subject of preaching the gospel from the standpoint of his life experiences as a young man, as someone in the midst of life, and then as a man who is elderly. He also talked about laboring with churches here in the United States domestically and then the challenges faced by preaching in foreign countries and concluded that series with an admonition that all of us need to respect and, and to uh, honor, and that is preach the word. And, and those were valuable uh, offerings, and we hope to be able to put them together, uh, not just simply to have distributed them once in the magazine, but make them available also in workbook format. Uh, we're producing a series of six lesson, short lesson workbooks that may serve a need, sometimes in certain kind of studies. Uh, a full 13 lesson workbook, say for a men's study that meets once a month, may sort of last a little longer than what people really want to focus on. It turns into a year long study and they may prefer a six month study. So some of these short workbooks may meet a need that has not been really tapped among brethren and this will hopefully be able to be added to the mix of those that we're offering. But at this time, we'll turn the podium over to Brother Humphreys, and he will speak on that great proclamation we must all affirm, I believe, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Brother John. I have poor eyesight, so but I'll push the wrong button. But anyway, I do appreciate very much to have you here listening to this few moments of study. And I appreciate very, very sincerely and deeply the privilege and the honor of being asked to participate this week uh, in this very important series of lectures. <clears throat> it is, of course, uh, something that I need to mention <clears throat> as well as the beginning. And that is that uh, if I tried to go through what I have in the book, we'll be here for an hour and a half. And so I, need to, I had to cut back on some of the things. But it's basically uh, kind of a scaled down version of what we have written in the uh, book. And so I think like Buddy Payne said last night, some things that I would, would maybe elaborate further on is in the book. <laughs> so anyway, my topic... I believe that Jesus Christ is and that is that it's a very important uh, topic of misunderstanding uh, at times and we need to hope that we can clarify that a little bit for us and uh, bring about a little bit better understanding. I think I'm to the choir on that. I think everybody in this room probably understands the things I'm going to say thoroughly, but it can be a matter of reinforcing it for us, I hope. We hope, like I said, to bring about a little bit better understanding on the part of Son, son of Man occurs over a hundred times in the Old Testament, and amazingly, uh, most of that Times. And it's also, I think, significant as well in that uh, book is where the Lord emphasizes to Ezekiel almost as many times, I am the Lord. In other words, uh, 
uh, other thing and emphasize it certainly tells us at what he and I'm paraphrasing in Ezekiel 3:11 you tell them what I the Lord am telling you to tell I have given you to tell the message I'm giving you is from your maker your creator I am the Lord and uh, you are humanity and you uh, as you look at the various to uh, a human being, uh, humanity, a, a person, a man. And so uh, that, that's the way it's used predominantly uh, in the Old Testament and uh, clearly emphasizes a human being. Now, we're going to be eventually a particular passage in Daniel that brings up something that uh, is a little bit more challenging and very important that a little bit but uh, man son of man of course are sometimes question for example in numbers 23 God is not a man that he should lie neither the son of man uh, talking about of course humanity God is not humanity I am the Lord remember what he said to Ezekiel and so uh, at the same time you can see the uh, parallelism there between man and uh, son of man. Uh, in the New Testament, of course, we have the, the expression used about 85 times, if I <laughs> count correctly. And uh, most of that uh, is used by the Lord Jesus himself. Uh, it's either him saying is said about him, and you have the breakdown there in the gospel accounts, and the other three exceptions to that remark in Acts chapter 7 and also the statements by written by the Apostle John in Revelation uh, 113 and uh, 14 14 of Revelation and so you know it basically uh, this way the Lord is using it and the way it is used in the New Testament ultimately I believe reflects Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13 and 14 which we will look at in just a little bit uh, now, often it is said that, you know, because we understand, uh, you know, it's talked about the nature of Jesus, that he's, uh, you know, the, the Son of Man referring to his humanity, but the Son of God referring to his uh, deity. But I, I'm begging you to understand at that uh, idea that there's much more involved, really, in both of those phrases, as a matter of fact, but especially uh, for our part in the Son of Man. There's more involved there. Uh, but we'll take it step by step. The idea of Son of uh, in the Scripture is not... often indicates... A and uh, exactly... Uh, the Son of Encouragement or Son of Exhortation because he was known, in Acts chapter 4, verse 36, that he was known uh, to be very good at this kind of activity. And so he was known as a son of encouragement. Again, uh, our Jesus in Acts 13, who was <clears throat> resisting the gospel, being preached to Sergius Paulus, uh, Paul said, you're a son of the devil because of, you're in one accord and, uh, with the devil. You're doing the devil's work and so on. And so, again, uh, the angels of Job in the uh, 38th chapter, sons of God, uh, in accord with the Lord, in accord with God. And uh, again, uh, the disciples uh, in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 45, in the matter of love for all, uh, be sons of the, for the Father in accord with God in, in, in loving all people. So you can see that the Son of Man uh, has a very strong uh, emphasis here that deity uh, has become of one accord with humanity 
and here's some scriptures that we're very familiar with. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, John 1.1. 1, 1. And then it tells us that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And, and as Paul kind of sums it up, God was manifested in the flesh. Now, that's the King James, New King James. There are other translations. It said he, but he that was the word that was God, <laughs> goes right. You, you bring it all together, God was manifested in the flesh. In other words, uh, in all things, like the Hebrew writer says, he was made like his brethren. And, of course, the emphasis in that, there was, of course, he could be a faithful and compassionate high priest for us, as our brother referred to this earlier in this morning. Now, uh, again, at the same time, we understand that the Son of Man has gone back to heaven, and no uh, man has ascended into heaven, but he who came down from heaven, even the Son of Man who is in heaven, John 3 and verse 13, from the words of Jesus. And again, as he states in John 6, what if you see the Son of Man ascend up to where he was before? So there's something very, very special, you see, about this idea of the Son of Man. And uh, the ideal Son of Man came down from heaven, according to John 3, 13, we just read, to deliver and bless the Son of Man, humanity, who was in bondage to sin. I think... This is emphasized in a number of, of passages, but of course he, he makes it clear in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And we're going to uh, look at Hebrews chapter 2 for just a few moments, which goes back to Psalms chapter 8. The Psalms 8 in, is here in, in the red. But the black here is the Hebrew uh, letter. Uh, but one testified in a certain place saying, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man, again, note that parallelism, man, son of man, that you take care of him. You have made him a little lower, and what's that idea? Made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. Now the Hebrew writer goes on, For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not see all things put under him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. See that similar description there uh, in Psalms 8? Put all things uh, made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God might taste death for every one. And if we had the time, we could also bring up Philippians chapter, excuse me, Philippians chapter 2, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ. You know the, you know the passage. That is, is also very beautifully paralleled here. Uh, but humanity was given dominion, is, is what the writer in Psalms 8 and Hebrews 2 is referring here. He was given dominion over all creation, and, but yet at the same time we understand in Genesis 3 that sin entered into the picture, and of course sin brings bondage. Sin causes us to be a slave of sin, and that's what Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. You're in bondage to sin. But again, at the same time, he also says, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. See how all these passages just parallel right down to the picture that, that deity came down and took upon himself flesh, became son of man, but he is a very special son of man in order to deliver you and me as sons and daughters of man from the bondage of sin. If the son makes us free, praise Lord, we're, sin, we're free indeed. Again, but the problem was that Jews, when they looked at Jesus, they only saw a man. And, and the text, there are many texts about this, but one in John 10 is very pow powerfully to the point. 
uh, that he, you know, he's just this lowly carpenter from Galilee. Uh, they took Jesus uh, to stone him, and Jesus said, well, I've done many good works. I've shown you from my Father. For which of these do you stone me? The Jews answered, saying, for a good work, we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. And so they were just seeing him as a, a human being, a fellow human being that, that really was in big trouble because he was claiming things he should not have claimed if he were only a man, a mere man. Uh, so, but we have some examples, some things that happened in the life of Christ that shows us this uniqueness of this particular son of man. Uh, the, he was more than a carpenter. Uh, because in Mark chapter 2, for example, you remember the story there of the man being let down through the roof and Jesus seeing this man saying, your sins are forgiven. Well, that created all kinds of a furor in the mind of these Jewish leaders that were there because only God can uh, forgive sin. And of course, that, that is true in the absolute. In other words, you might uh, do something wrong against me, maybe evil against me, and I say, oh, I, I forgive you. But well, has God forgiven you? You see, that, there's two different things here. And so that's the truth of the matter is only God can forgive in the absolute complete sense of the, of the idea of forgiveness. And, and you have scriptures there. We don't have the time to go into those, but they're there in the, in the reference. And so the idea there is Jesus said, so that you might know that the Son of Man has the authority or has power to forgive sins, I say to the man, get up and walk. And, and the man got up and he, he healed him to demonstrate that he had this authority, this power to uh, forgive sins. And in other words, he was God incarnate. The word had become flesh and we beheld his glory as John points out in John 1.14. And so this is not merely just a human being operating here. This son of man is very, very unique and special. Uh, another another instance uh, incident that took place as well, his disciples were shush, shucking grain on, on the Sabbath, and they were accusing him of violating the Sabbath. Of course, uh, you know, he had a number of things to say to them, but one of the things that he said that was absolutely thunderous was that the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Now, that that is tremendous statement because the Sabbath was commanded and disobedience to that or violators were punished by God. In Exodus 20, he gave the law. In, in Numbers 15, a man picking up sticks on the Sabbath, God said, take him out and stone him. I'm going to tell him, give you a demonstration that you're not to, to tamper with my law, with my authority and, and set aside what I have commanded you. Ezekiel chapter 20, he sent the whole nation into captivity, among other things, of violating the Sabbath uh, there in Ezekiel chapter 20. And so uh, God the Father was the one who's involved with the giving of the Sabbath and regulating the Sabbath. And for any humanity to come along, uh, they had zero authority to do any of this kind of thing. And so it was blasphemous arrogance for any mere man to claim lordship or authority over the Sabbath. It's that Jesus said, I'm Lord of the Sabbath. And so again, the Son of Man is deity in the flesh to proclaim himself to have that kind of authority and power to regulate the Sabbath. So again, th again this, this idea of the Son of Man is very, very special. Now, I think it's rooted in this great prophecy in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13 and 14. And I want us to look, uh, we're just going to have to do it very, very briefly here. But look at, look at the context uh, that exhibits the awesome authority of this Son of Man that is mentioned here uh, in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13 and 14. But uh, it's, it's, it's powerful as you look at these dreams and visions that lead up to this particular proclamation or prophecy, if you please, in Daniel 7. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had a dream when they were taken into captivity uh, in Daniel 2. And the, the king saw this great image 
with the head of gold, breast and arms of silver, and belly and thigh of brass or bronze, legs of iron and feet of iron, and my iron mixed with miry clay, and then, of course, a stone cut without hands came down, smote the image, destroyed the image, and became a great mountain that filled the whole earth. Well, what in the world did all that involve, you see? What, in the, what was the meaning of that? The, the king was very excited about it. And uh, we just read a few of the verses. Uh, in Daniel chapter 2, it says, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> you watched while a stone was cut without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron, clay, and broke them in pieces. And then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like uh, chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth, you see. Well, uh, again, this is, th these are artist conceptions. Uh, you know, I don't know how the thing looked except from the description in Daniel. So here are artist conceptions. But anyway, you have four powerful kingdoms. And these powerful kingdoms were Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Now, uh, I believe that we can show from Scripture that that this is the, this, these are the ones. He said, you're the head of gold. That's Babylon. That took care of the head. And, uh, uh, and of course, uh, in chapter 8, we have uh, two kingdoms there mentioned in chapter 8 of Daniel, verse 20. You have the, the uh, Medo-Persian ram and then the Grecian or Macedonian goat. Uh, and then in chapter 9, to the end of that chapter, the last paragraph, you have Jerusalem after it has been rebuilt is going to be destroyed. Well, who destroyed it? The Romans in AD 70. And, uh, and of course, uh, Jesus, when you come upon the scene in Matthew, or rather Mark, chapter 3, in verse 14 and 15, he said, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, the previous verse, he said, he was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And he said, time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. And Luke chapter 2 and verse 1, and Luke chapter 3 and verse 1, you have the two Caesars. Well, who are they? The Caesar were the king of Britain? No, that was Caesars of Rome. So I think you can see that these, these are the four king, kingdoms, and these were very powerful kingdoms of this world. They, they, were, they, were, they were not just little, little tiny principalities over here. These were, these were kingdoms that ruled the known world at their time, in their day. And, uh, and so uh, at this particular time, uh, you have the coming of this stone that was smiting the image and destroying it, having more power and more authority than these great world kingdoms, and it becomes a great kingdom itself. I should mention that in Daniel 7, these four kingdoms come back again uh, in the form of the lion and the bear and the leopard and the, and the monster beast uh, there, which of course uh, in, involves the persecution that Rome brought against the church of the Lord Jesus. I think Daniel 7 could be very well looking at, Ro at Revelation 13 if, you, if you're interested in that. But anyway, uh, uh, Jesus, the, the stone had all authority to judge and destroy the kingdoms of men. Look at uh, verse uh, 44. And in the days of these kings uh, of Daniel 2, Daniel 2 verse 44, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, bronze, clay, silver, and gold, the great God has made known to the king what shall come to pass after, the, after this, the dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. So you have then th this, this uh, thing that we're leading up to, this stone, is awesome because these are, these are powerful, all-powerful kingdoms there in their day. They rule the world. And so to overcome them, to lead them aside, to tear them aside and, and, and be stronger and more powerful than they are with more authority, and glory and majesty and honor and so forth uh, than they is, is some doing. So uh, that's the awesome context that you have uh, of this particular passage we're going to be looking at because here you have this, this stone that smote the image, which is the kingdom of 
Christ and God, Ephesians 5, 5, and also uh, Jesus saying, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all the kingdoms, go preach the gospel to every creature, and so on. And then in Mark chapter 1 saying, the kingdom of God is at hand, uh, it, it's, it's obviously referring to this time of Christ coming upon the earth, selecting his apostles, sending the Holy Spirit upon them, and Acts 2, you have this great beginning of the preaching of the gospel, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, or the kingdom of the Lord. And, of course, this, this awesome authority that he has, which is greater than any kingdom, greater than all those four kingdoms that was in Daniel 2 and 7, and, 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 and is greater than anything today. He has authority over all power, all authority, in principalities and so on, uh, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 22, if you want a passage there. So uh, the Son of Man will rule this powerful kingdom, this great stone that becomes the great worldwide mountain, you see. And now we look at Daniel 7, 13 and 14. I was watching, Daniel says, I, in the night visions, and behold one like the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Who is the Ancient of Days? This is the Father in his glory. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, and all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, not unlike these worldly kingdoms. You know, we have a song, the kingdoms of earth pass away one by one, but the kingdom of heaven shall stand. We sing that song. They, 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 it's an everlasting dominion, everlasting kingdom, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. It will be delivered up to the Father, 1 Corinthians 15. But anyway, these four kingdoms were powerful. They were awesome in their time. And, and yet, how can anyone, who believes the word of God. Read these prophecies, the context here around this prophecy of Daniel 7, 13, and 14, and not be highly impressed with the glory, the deity, the power, and authority of the Son of Man, our blessed Lord Jesus Christ, as Paul te testifies of him in 2 Corinthians 1. And as Thomas confessed, my Lord and my God. Anyway, for any man to claim this prophecy, any mere man to claim this prophecy would be blasphemous nonsense, ridiculous, absurd. Now watch it. In Matthew chapter 26 at the mistrial of Jesus, and the high priest answered and said to him, this is Caiaphas, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, It is as you say. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power, the Ancient of Days of Daniel 7, of the Father, and coming on the clouds of heaven. Woo! Jesus very clearly claims that he's Daniel 7, 13, and 14. There's no doubt about that. And the high priest caught it as well. The high priest understood the affirmation. And as he was viewing Jesus as only a son of man, here's his reaction as he tore his garments. Then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look, you have heard his blasphemy. But, of course, we understand that Jesus is telling the truth. He is indeed the Son of Man over and over uh, with proof of this, as we noted some of those examples of, of this proof that he gave. And, uh, and he is the unique Son of Man of Daniel 7, 13 and 14. And he's deity incarnate, the word becoming flesh or made flesh. And so the Son of Man, of course, come, becomes a highly, highly exalted title in view of these uh, scriptural facts that we've looked at. And so we dare not question the divine nature or the authority of the Son of Man. Now, I 
uh, was also given the uh, assignment of, of looking at some of the uh, rejection of the Son of Man and dealing with that a little bit, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But I want us to understand that this passage in Daniel 7, 13, and 14 carries with it that all would serve him, all the nations, all the peoples, and all the languages would serve him, carries with the idea of judgment, the authority to judge. And, uh, and of course, this is uh, something that the Bible says, uh, John chapter 5 especially, for the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. And again, down here in, in the 27th verse of John 5, and has given him authority to execute judgment also, because why? Why? Because he is the Son of Man, of Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13 and 14. And so uh, he has eternal judgment over all, which we look at as the, as the final wrap-up of things on, on his judgment. The Son of Man comes. Son of Man comes in his glory. And the holy angels with him. He gathers all the nations before him, and he divides them as a shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. And, and, uh, and so we're all here to stand before him on that last day. And all who are under or own or in the sea or on the earth will answer to the Son of Man because we're all commanded, we're all destined to serve him and it's rebellion and condemnation and eternal judgment not to serve him according to these scriptures. Uh, whether one believes in the Son of Man or whether he disbelieves, he's going to be there. Are all going to give account. All will stand before him and give account. And it's going to be a terrifying reality for the ungodly who have spoken ungodly things and their ungodly deeds and their ungodly ways and so forth. The un irreverence characterizes their life. Ungodly irreverence characterizes their life. They're going to answer for it. Whether they think they will or not, they are. They will. And, uh, of course, it's going to be a glorious vindication for the believers. Uh, now, we want to consider, as we said a while ago, the, the fact that the, the people rejected this. They rejected this. And uh, the Son of Man was despised and rejected. It was a matter of prophecy, Isaiah 53. And, uh, and so uh, we look at what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 1.23, for we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks, or to the world, uh, foolishness. And so to the Jew and to the Gentile, the, the Lord had faced rejection there, and he faces that rejection today. And we're going to look at that very briefly. In fact, looking at the Jewish uh, group of rejectors, John kind of sums it up. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. They rejected him. Now, there was always a faithful remnant. That's, another, that's a whole other lecture, the remnant of God in the Old Testament, New Testament. But he had those remnant people, the few, faithful few, but the majority did not uh, accept what he had to offer. They, they had a different perspective, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and then if the world hates you, that's be the Gentile out here, you know that it hated me before it hated you, John 15, and, and so all men hate the light, John 3. So, uh, uh, you know, Jewish rulers viewed others as ignorant and unlearned because they didn't know what they knew. But at the same time, these Jewish leaders, these elitists, misread the prophets and ignorantly rejected the Messiah and his kingdom. How do I know that? Because that's what the Bible tells me. The apostle Peter, in talking to the group there, after he'd healed the, he and John had healed the man there at the gate, beautiful gate, he said, now thou brethren, the crowd that gathered, I know that through ignorance, he's talking about them killing the Lord Jesus, he said, I know that through ignorance you did it, as did also your rulers. Ignorance. Ignorance of what the prophets were actually teaching. And we'll go into that a little bit more detail in a minute. But then also the Apostle Paul in the, in the, in the Acts of uh, Presidia, he said uh, in the synagogue of the Jews there, he said, and they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers that take in the Sanhedrin, 
because they knew him not, nor, now watch this carefully, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they are fulfilled, they, they fulfill them in condemning him. Both Peter and the Apostle Paul points out the fact that these men, these Jewish leaders, the Sanhedrin Council, that was the elite, most intelligent and most educated leadership among the Jews in their day. Now, they, they obviously had some of them in there probably that were kind of dudders, but they also had people in there like Gamaliel as well, you see, who were, who were scholarly. And so these people were the elitist, and yet at the same time we saw those scriptures that through ignorance of the scriptures, even though they could probably quote it in the Hebrew and the Aramaic and, every, and, the, and, and, and the Septuagint and all the rest, they, they knew the language, they knew the culture, they knew the theology, they knew, all, they knew all that stuff, and yet they missed it when it came to understanding the nature of the Messiah and his kingdom. They were ignorant. In spite of their scholarship and intelligence, these rulers taught false doctrine concerning the Messiah and his kingdom. Plain and simple. Plain and simple. Now, this should be a solemn warning to all of us, really. No matter how smart we think we are, how highly educated, and I'm not against in, in, uh, intelligence. I wish I had more. Uh, and I'm not uh, opposed to scholarship. I wish I had more. But, but that doesn't give you a, a, a blank check to just write out anything you, you think you believe. You need to make certain it's verified in the Scripture. But false assumptions, human traditions, pride, they didn't love the truth, politics over faith, covetousness, ignorance, empty rituals, hypocrisy, being stiff-necked, judgmental, bias. Somebody said one time, upon what do you bias your conclusions? And, and there's a lot of truth in that. And, uh, and spiritual blindness, these failings led them astray. And we could go and, and preach a sermon on all those points right there because you could find examples in the gospel of these things. And, uh, and so... The, the, they taught some truth. Now, don't misunderstand. They taught a lot of truth. Matthew 23, where Jesus said, when they're sitting in Moses' seat, that is, when they're properly giving exegesis of the law of Moses, that you do. But don't do, don't follow them. Uh, but but he, and, and in fact, of the matter, he finally he told them blankly in Matthew 15, they're blind guides. In fact, he later on in Matthew 23, he said, blind guides. You, 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 you. Throw out the gnat and swallow a camel kind of thing. So, you know, you know they, 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 were, they were smart people. They were highly intelligent. They knew the Old Testament law backwards and forwards, but they didn't always understand every aspect of it. And, and they taught a lot of truth, but there was a lot, of, a lot of error there too as well. And that's the thing that's so scary about it, isn't it, brethren? That's so scary. And so there are two key pictures of, of the Messiah in the Bible, let's see what time it is. Oh my word! Is it 20 hour? Well, anyway, uh, the one picture, and I'm just going to have to touch this because we don't have time. The conquering Messiah who'd sit on David's throne. There are many passages that emphasize that, uh, that uh, and that they would deliver the Jews from their enemies. The Jews knew of David's great victories. They knew about these things. And so they looked for a liberating Messiah that would come and deliver them from the power of Rome. And God will give him the throne of his father David to sit on the throne of David. And here's a passage in, in Luke chapter 1. And, and Zacharias is prophesying by the Holy Spirit. And he said, uh, he raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David as he spoke by the mouth of his prophets who have been since the world began. Now watch it. That we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to perform mercy and so forth. And then again saying down in the red, being delivered from the hand of our enemies and that might serve him without fear. Now that, you, can, you can look at that and interpret that two different ways. You can interpret that, of course, as a spiritual deliverance, which I believe. But on the other hand, some could say, oh, he's going to be a great a warrior king like David. And, and like Jesus had to leaving because they were coming by force to take him and make him a king and he had to, to get away from that in, in John chapter 6 and verse 15 he said they, they, they were of course there were bloody conflicts with Rome going on all this time and again 
Jesus told him, he's, uh, Pilate, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight, and so on. Uh, and he said, the kingdom of God is within you. It's spiritual. Uh, and so uh, we have the, the, the true deliverance, and Paul describes this in 2 Corinthians 10. We don't have the time to go into it. But the point is that, it, you know, it's like uh, an army coming and conquering a city, tearing down the walls and everything. But Paul makes it clear that the walls here are thoughts, uh, are ideals, ideas that are contrary to God's will and so forth. And that, so it's a spiritual conflict, you see, all the way through. Now, you contrast that with the other picture of the Messiah in the Old Testament, and, and it, you have, it, it, to the Jews, this became a stumbling block, the crucifixion. And uh, he's rejected, a suffering servant who would be killed. Uh, he, he, he is, all that look at me, cast me to, uh, laugh me to scorn, and he is despised and rejected. Zechariah prophesied, strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter, quoted in Matthew 26 and 31. So you have this, this picture, not of a, of a conquering warrior king coming to liberate the nation from the powers of Rome and all that, but you have uh, someone who comes and is, and is killed. And, and, and when they were discussing this in John 12, they said, who is this son of man? That's not the son of man we're looking for. And, and of course, he, as Paul or Peter says, that he's a stone, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Now, both pictures, of course, do re apply. Now, some Jews said there were two messiahs. We can't even go into that. It's in the book. <laughs> it's in the book if you want to read about it further. But uh, the Son of Man went to the cross before he ascended to heaven. That's the answer to it. Uh, the cross came before the crown. Again, uh, the Gentiles also rejected the Son of Man like the Jews did. Uh, to them, it was foolishness. And to many, the idea of some Jew dying for them to, to save them was just ignorant uh, nonsense and so uh, it, it was a superstitious fable laughable madness and so on uh, and it's the same today many many uh, people reject uh, the, the idea of, of what the Bible presents that worldly believers mock and ridicule the truth and false teachers corrupt God's word uh, theologians and religious leaders today much, are really much like the intelligent and scholarly Jewish Sanhedrin Council. Blind leaders of the blind describe both groups, unfortunately. Uh, and, and of course, many of today's theologians and leaders in theology and so forth, they're skilled in a lot of things. They're skilled in the Bible languages, biblical languages. They know it backwards and forwards. They know the culture. They study it the history, traditions, theology, but, but so were the Jewish leaders. Jewish leaders lived it. Today's theologians study about it 2,000 years later but, and both have faulty theology. Both teach a lot of truth, but also much that is contrary to the Bible. And that's the sad thing. And so the lesson, we may have a great, great intellect and vast knowledge and yet teach falsely uh, and pervert the truth. But I have to also say, uh, dudders like me can also be dense and uneducated and, and very wrong. So it doesn't matter. It cuts both ways, you see. <laughs> it cuts both ways. Uh, so we can be blinded by bias, prejudice, unbelief, Calvinism, dispensationalism, liberalism. You, you can say all that kind of stuff. Many things can, can blind us and lead us astray. How much time do I have? Do we have a couple of three minutes? Is that it? I can't. Who? How much? Okay, thank you. We can be blinded by all these things, and so we must sincerely love the Lord and his truth to overcome self, the problems of pride, etc., and error that's abounding all around us, and unbelief that's in this world. And the Son of Man's challenge, if anyone is willing, and there's the key, if anyone is willing to do his, <clears throat> his will, he will know the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak from myself. This was issued to the Jews of his time and it's also a challenge for any of us today. Same thing. We have to be willing to do his will and then we can know. We will know and the will to know the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth was and still is missing with many. Uh, the 
there's an endless song. I, I, we won't be able to go into this at all, but there, there are many attacks in all these areas, and it's, again, it's in the book. You have to go to the book. And, uh, and Satan uh, brings all these things to power to bear, and, of course, uh, he, he uh, mocks and distributes misinformation, and we need to be understanding that the pressure is great to conform to the world. Uh, these attacks against the Bible uh, is also accompanied with our own problems, our own inner demons of the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye and the pride of life. And our nation today is being gored to death by the two-horned beast of violence and immorality as a result. And the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Uh, the flood of lies that are in Revelation 12, that same idea, the flood of lies, are out there and, uh, and the world is just swallowing it whole. And that's, that's a challenge that we have. And uh, we're looking, we must look to the Son of Man. The urgent need today is to reflect the light of the Son of Man in our lives and to remember that he said, I will confess you if we confess him. I'll deny you if you deny me. And so the most important question before us today, I stand and you sit facing this issue, what is my relationship to the Son of Man? Thank you.